Welcome to another edition of our Fireside Streams, an at-home discussion between the FS team and a broad range of characters from the zeitgeist, from macro thinkers and artists to change makers and disruptors. Hi, I'm Jayanna Mize, the VP of Home Interiors and Design, and I'd like to welcome Julia Watson. She's a designer, activist, academic, and author of Low Tech Design by Radical Indigenism. Julia teaches urban design at Harvard Graduate School of Design and at Columbia University's Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation, while also leading her own experimental landscape and urban design practice, Julia Watson Studio. She's also a director and co-founder of A Future Studio, a consultancy of designers focused on positively changing our interconnected ecologies. So join us as we talk about Julia's journey to low tech and indigenous design how she got here and why it matters as we progress as a society in regards to climate change and how to ratify landscapes and design practices. I'm going to be speaking with her in reference to our uh, spring summer 22 sentiment rebirth. To tell you a little bit about rebirth really quickly, um, rebirth speaks to finding second chances. It's by acknowledging what we've learned in past lives, we are trying again with a renewed understanding of interconnectedness, clarity of consciousness, and our bond with Mother Earth. We look to the wisdom of indigenous first peoples and find blueprints for rebuilding our communities. So with that, I'd like to welcome Julia. Hi, how are you doing? Thank you. Yeah, we're so excited about this. But first, before we even get started into your whole realm of low tech, let's start by having you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you really got into this field. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm originally Australian. I'm now an American citizen. I've been here 14 years. So I've, I've transitioned, but I keep one foot in each country. Um, and I started off as an architect and studied architecture and then the transition into really looking low tech started in my second year architecture school. They had this compulsory seminar, which was called Aboriginal Environments. And I think it was really ahead of its time. I don't think they do this even now in any of the courses around the world. And it really introduced us to this whole other world of indigenous landscapes in Australia. And that got me really fascinated in the topic. So that was you know, 20 years ago. And um, just being, kind of like rolling down that road of investigation and research ever since. So I studied architecture, then went on to study landscape architecture. Mm -hmm. And then I came after a couple of years working in London, like every single Aussie does, came back home to Australia and then got into graduate school at Harvard. And oh, so wow. I made my way, yeah, made my way over here, the one way ticket and a, like a dream about what I was going to do for a year and a half. And then I never left. So 14 years later, still here teaching and just really finding a way for the sort of deep interest in Aboriginal environments and different ways humans relate to nature to bring that into you know, our contemporary and our current crises, but also our contemporary, our current thinking about the world. That's so interesting um, from a design perspective, because I definitely feel like we are desperately trying to search how to get back to our roots all the time yeah. and so sort out this whole mess. Our whole team was so inspired by you as we were working on our sentiments for spring 22 and your radical solutions for design and landscapes that you've labeled as low tech. Um, so what is the term low tech, which is the main sentiment of your book and how you're defining yeah. your work? Is it a term that you've kind of coined for this movement? Yeah, it's a term I completely made up. It's, and I mean, it's really synonymous with the idea of the book and the idea of the work. Um, but it was also, it's like a tongue in cheek. It's a little bit of a poke at our contemporary view of how we think of these technologies as primitive because low tech, L-O-W-T-E-C-H, which is kind of the way these technologies have always been described is incorrect low tech systems, that terminology, are pretty rudimentary. They're often manufactured, they're industrial. Um, they're just, they're not the same thing as what we're looking at here, but these technologies get called that and are kind of looked down upon in a way. And so TEK, which means traditional ecological knowledge is the basis of all these technologies. 
And so it's a redefinition of what these technologies are and kind of like poking fun at these inherited biases that we have and saying that this is actually not rudimentary. These are not primitive. These are incredibly sophisticated. They're incredibly complex and they're incredibly symbiotic with our natural environment. So we need to come up with something else, to, a way to understand these and something else to call these. So low tech was my, um, my way to sort of reconceive of what these technologies are and identify them outside of what we see as low tech and high tech. That's so interesting and so right on the money. I love it. And in your book, you really start by explaining how the European enlightenment is constructed by this mythology of technology. Can you break that down a little bit more for our listeners? Because I really don't feel like many people understand that their everyday items all the way to their landscapes were ultimately constructed kind of by white males or like the yeah. colonization era and i hate to say it like that but it's very true and yeah you know, a lot of our systems aren't correct <laughs> so like how yeah. do we how do we break that down for our listeners a little bit yeah i mean the more the, the reason I started teaching, the uh, reason I started writing this because I was teaching a course on technology in the landscape and everything I came across was high tech or manufactured or of that sentiment, yet we're, we're talking about sustainability and somehow that didn't seem to be incredibly synonymous to me. And I looked into, you know, where did all this come from and what's the alternative to this? And they have been identified by a couple of authors. One of them was Fikret Burks, who a lot of my work is based upon. He talks about the enlightenment as a period when there was all the technologies in the world available to us, but there were Western technologies um, at a group of men, white men in Europe that said, this is the technologies that we're gonna identify as technologies and we're going to use these and move them forward and our civilizations are gonna be um, very closely aligned with them, somewhat dependent upon them. And that legacy is something that we're still caught within. And we think that's the only thing, that, that's the only possible form of technology coming from industrialization to manufacturing to where we are now. And it's manufactured, it's not, real, it's not so much built out of our resources, it's not built out of scarcity, it doesn't have checks and balances related to our ecosystems. It's built, these technologies are really built out of, you know, whatever we can evolve, whatever we can extract, and there's no limits. And so that's where, that's how we kind of conceived of technology then, but also we conceived of a very small portion of the technologies that were available, all the indigenous technologies around the world that weren't identified, that communities weren't in contact. A lot of the um, Asian, a lot of the South American, all the countries that weren't really colonized at that time had all these technologies that were then through colonization erased as land, boundaries, farming, all these other influence came into the landscapes and just erased, eroded, destroyed, removed all these technologies that were available that were born of the landscape, that were born of the people and born of thousands or hundreds of years of knowledge and understanding and people living in a place. And so we're at this period of time where we have almost this universal and homogenous understanding of technology and we don't identify that there's all these unique locally based diverse technologies available for us out there in the world to look at to understand and perhaps to think of this as this whole other group of sustainable technologies that could bear not only for the communities who we've told that's not valuable they could become incredibly valuable but also in us exploring what new technologies are on the forefront that are incredibly sustainable, that have low embodied energy, low impact to their environments, low cost, and could be really far more scalable than a high tech costly technology that's built in a contemporary uh, metropolitan city and for a contemporary metropolitan city. That's, yeah, that's, what are some of the like most radical examples that you've seen of low tech kind of happening? Um, one of the ones that I talk about, um, I've got two that I think they're really incredible. Well, I got, I've got so many actually, <laughs> but two of them that I think are, are um, kind of at uh, different ends or different extremes that one of them is the East Kolkata wetlands. And that's a system that is relatively new. It's about a hundred years old. It is a sewage wastewater aquaculture treatment landscape 
So instead of like your typical, what they call in India, and this is located in India, instead of called an STP or a sewage treatment plant, which is like our industrial form of sewage wastewater treatment, the city in Calcutta has converted its wetlands that sit on the edge of the city to convert its wastewater, its sewage water that comes out of the city into clean water. But it doesn't just do one thing like a wastewater treatment plant does. It also grows the food for the city it, by providing irrigation water for rice and for vegetables that are grown around this area. It provides, um, it offers food for fish that are grown in this aquaculture system that feed on the sewage. So 20% of the food from the city comes from this sewage wastewater treatment area. It provides 100,000 jobs for people who live in the city. It's like a recreation area. People live around this area. It's a natural landscape. It sequesters carbon. It protects from flooding. So it has all these incredible services that are completely free, that it offers to the city. Um, but interestingly enough, the government there is still trying to sell off the land and develop it because they only make their tax dollar through investment on, of, of land purchasing and through taxing citizens who have land. So this is really weird contestation from this completely natural landscape that offers all these services more than just a wastewater treatment plant. It also saves the city $22 million in operating a wastewater treatment plant per year, but they're not identifying that this is an incredibly forward thinking technology and they're trying to erase it right now. So that's kind of like one of the most impressive systems that is incredibly contemporary. Mm -hmm. um, and what's another one? There's a beautiful system uh, in China that's called the Hujiao Mulberry um, Silk uh, Aquaculture System. And it's, it's like a traditional system for rearing silkworms and it's a polder dike system. And that means like a dike is like a berm or like something that separates two bodies of water, like a, a hill or a mound. And then there's all these pools, which are called polders. And on the dikes, which surround the pools, they grow mulberry trees. And in the mulberry trees, they rear um, silkworms. The silkworms produce silk, feeding off the mulberry tree leaves. The excrement and the cocoons drops into the water and it feeds the fish in the ponds. And then the, the fish, the fish like excrement actually is drawn from the bottom of the pools, it's used as fertilizer for the trees. So there's this beautiful closed loop system that provides textile, it provides food, it provides flood mitigation for the city of Hujiao, which is downstream. And it's actually part of this incredibly much bigger flood protection system in that area. So it's this beautiful relationship between silkworms and fish rearing and providing you know, all these materials for human beings, but also flood protection and carbon sequestration. And it's thousands of years old. So you've got the two extremes that kind of doing similar things a little bit differently and providing us different things. Wow. That, I mean, I bet that is like absolutely gorgeous when you're able to see it yeah. in, real, in real life. It's really crazy to think that, you know, when colonization was happening or even, you know, pushed forward to modern times, there's been really no consideration of a lot of these past traditions um, that the indigenous people like really spent hundreds, thousands of years perfecting and mm -hmm. learning from the land. So, you know, us here at Fashion Snoops, we're always trying to figure out ways to relay um, movements to consumers, you know, like from kind of projection all the way down to how does that really happen? So how do we get consumers to slow down and really understand we need to rethink this process with modern technology in mind? Mm. I mean, I think for the fashion industry, which I think at this point is one of the most interesting industries and the most interested in this idea of really taking on sustainability and regenerative, regenerative planetary thinking and looking at the industry and saying, okay, we're the second biggest polluter in the world. We really have to be held accountable for what's happening. And we are also this industry more than any of the sort of other arts uh, and crafts we think of in that same vein, the fashion industry, has a very personal identity with the consumer. 
that me as an architect, I, I don't have as much. Mm -hmm. And so when people buy a brand or, or a piece of clothing, they're really constructing their identity. And I think that's really powerful in what the fashion industry has to convey about the, the idea of not just thinking about the individual, thinking about the individual, thinking about the community, thinking about the planet and thinking about sort of with your purchases, with what you support and how you want to identify yourself, what is the scale of impact and the scale of identity and thinking that you're having on the planet? And so that's a consumer choice. And I think that brands who are really starting to look at regenerative agriculture, looking at how their manufacturing industrial processes impact the communities who are using the, who are doing those processes for the brands those that type of thinking i think is really foundational for changing the industry and changing that incredible impact that the industry is having it's it's really true i mean and hopefully more and more consumers like really hold them accountable and they're definitely starting to look for more and more transparency behind a lot of the manufacturing mm -hmm. processes all the way even into home and like the furniture pur purchases that you make and lighting and things i mean people don't realize how much waste or toxic um, mm -hmm. things are really going into your home all the time i find it fascinating as someone who like really studies design from this socio-economic perspective it's really clear that we're creating this huge climate catastrophe really mm -hmm. from you know manufacturing all these products and your book was really eye-opening to read on how our technology advancements of culture really led to this through history. I thought that was awesome. And mm -hmm. I'm really questioning like how we can design cities and infrastructures to be more low tech. Like what is the, what are the steps we really need to take that, you know, someone who is kind of new to this can do? Cause I feel like we're up against a lot of companies that have done things the same way their whole lives. They don't want to change, but they know they have to. So they're just kind of stuck. Like, what are, how do we design these infrastructures going forward? Yeah, I mean, I think we're at this moment where we've kind of cheekily been allowed to get away with all these, um, these hidden costs and these hidden impacts. And we're like, okay, the primary motivator for our economic and political thinking and all our processes is economic profit and economic profit to no end or to what end? And I, and I say this in the same way, like when I lectured, there was an architect in 1966, Cedric Price, and he said, you know, if technology is the answer, what was the question? It was this really interesting moment in a lecture when people were like, what was technology supposed to do for us? How has it changed us? And people said, to look at like, how has technology changed cities? How has technology changed societies? What's its impact on culture? And I feel like we're thinking about sustainability in the same way today. We're like, well, sustainability is the answer. What was the question? Because like, you know, we can keep on going up higher. We can keep on building out wire. We can keep on becoming denser. We can keep on going deeper to extract, you know, all these ancient fuels. But to what end is like sustainability actually going to save us if our impact just keeps on increasing exponentially? Like there's nothing that's going to be able to really impact that forefront of thinking. So we're at this moment where we're starting to see those hidden and latent um, and indirect costs hit our pockets, hit our air, hit our lungs. You know, this, we're still wearing masks, whether it's viral transmission or whether it's carbon emission coming from the fires. It's all the same stuff. We live in cities, but the fires still impact us. They impact us from the other side of the country. So it's not that you live in a city and you're completely disconnected from your countryside or your natural environment. Those natural environments are on fire. You can't walk out of your house. In your cities so there's a way that we need to understand those connections and the, the first thing i really think we need to understand is the management of those landscapes and the people who steward and manage those landscapes need to have some sort of um reparation or or compensation and need to be acknowledged by municipal governments that they are providing an incredible service to the cities and it's not just in you know the west coast in so many countries like East Kolkata wetlands that I just mentioned, there's 100,000 workers who are protecting the cities from floods, who are sequestering carbon. They just get money for selling fish. They're not given any reparation for any of those services that they provide to the city of Calcutta 
saving that city $21 million for a wastewater treatment plant. So where is government really understanding that there are free service? I mean, we already take complete advantage of the free service that nature provides, but let's actually, you know, understand that these are technologies. These technologies are being highly managed and they're being adapted and they're protecting citizens and they're protecting infrastructures. Why don't we understand that we need to compensate those communities for their services? That would lead to, you know, more communities staying in situ in those places to protect their, their technologies, to expand their technologies. It would be, provide a vehicle for scaling those technologies. Then you get the other side of what are we going to do in the cities that we have right now with the sort of remnants of modernism and postmodernism and what we're moving forward to. Are we going to just create these incredibly high tech smart cities? Are we going to keep on that line of thinking that got us here in the first place? Are we going to, going to rethink this approach? And I think, you know, as our cities expand, which we know they're going to as more populations move towards cities, what is going to be the development that happens as these cities grow, because we know in cities they're growing exponentially and those second and third growth rings, are we gonna put in more wastewater treatment plants that are the type that we have now that provide a single service? Are we gonna think about, can we provide services that will be predictive of more pandemics, that'll be predictive of fires, will be predictive of flooding and will be predictive of the type of infrastructures we need for these expanded communities. And maybe we think about decentralized planning rather than sort of centralized planning that we have now that is from the 20th and the 19th century that we've inherited. Like, what's the new form of thinking that we have now? We have so much, you know, so much technology in the information, uh, information technology that our cities are rapidly changing. Like, when are we going to catch up in the way that we think about the other infrastructures that are really important to our cities? Right. It's like, when are we going to stop just trying to make a profit or those yeah. types of things and really start refocusing on how to sustain this beautiful planet that we have and especially I'm constantly looking for new innovations that cities are doing or ways that they're kind of um, you know bringing back those indigenous designs or even you know trying to push sustainability forward do you know of any you know cities that are really on the forefront maybe people could you know use that as a model there are cities like I would say um, Singapore is an incredible city for really looking at its limits because it's an island. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have much agriculture. It has a really limited supply of fresh water. And so they put in place some incredible urban planning and urban design measures and replanting of indigenous tropical landscapes. But I would say that it's, it's, it's not really so much looking at sort of the, you know, what are the indigenous cultures and threading culture into those landscapes in, in the way that I talk about it. But definitely Singapore is an incredible case study of how we can be really forward thinking in a very contemporary city that's already maxed out on some of its limits and, and trying to sort of keep up. You know, they have incredible tariffs if you want to drive a car. You know, all of those conveniences there's a price tag on those. So you, you're you sort of forced into the sustainable lifestyle in a way, if you want to live there for, for having all those advantages and, and, you know, for having all those facilities that are a little, little bit superfluous available to you. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there's been a lot of projects recently that are more in the vein of high tech um, that have kind of like been on the drawing board that have been taken off the drawing board. Like, um, it, the um, what was going on in Toronto, um, Sidewalk Labs with Google, that was initially a huge project that was really looking on law, lowering carbon footprints um, through use of different materials through mass timber, which is a diff not using concrete and using um, a, a timber as a material that has a limit to height. But you know, those, 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 um, but that was still in the, the, the vein of smart thinking and smart cities. So I guess there was sort of a, a, a balance between, or, or maybe an unbalance between understanding limits um, and, but also trying to embed some type of sustainable thinking. 
Um, but really relying on technology to say like, well, what are our limits? Well, it's all the data that we can derive from the system, but to what end will we derive all this data to really, you know, we know these systems are co so complex that some of, you know, some of the models can't really reflect and understand the complexity nor model out like the future trajectories when we have so many complex crises coming into play as well. Um, I think, you know, some of the work that's being done in Australia that is really looking at trying to understand how pyrotechnology is, indigenous pyrotechnology is starting to be transferred and make its way into broader landscapes and be taught to different communities. So there's huge sort of grassroots initiatives to combine um, sort of this idea of how do we expand regenerative uh, pyrotechnology and, and, and that concept of like regenerative grassroots networks that actually are becoming global networks rather than just sort of regional and local networks. Um, but I don't, I think sometimes this thinking is a little bit still in its research R&D phase. It hasn't, and this is, you know, I, I worked on this for seven years um, and the book came out at the end of last year. So I'm hoping that more people are going to move, start moving these ideas forward and start pushing the movement in, into, and, and uh, as well as myself, into practice on the ground. Well, that segues me into my last question, which I'm very sad about, but I want to know what's next? You know, you wrote the book and are you going to work on an, um, another book or any fun projects? Could you tell us what's in the, in the works for you? Yeah, um, there's always a lot going on, which is always <laughs> incredibly exciting. Um, what's next? There is another book in the works. Um, so that's, that's, that's in the future. We're actually looking at doing some um, uh, documentary series that are based on this type of thinking and working with a number of Indigenous um, women and to create a team of women who are going to produce, uh, write and produce, and move this type of um, a series forward. Um, so, sort of looking at a lot of different mediums. Um, I'm also working always on the ground. So, we're doing projects in the city here. We just did Rockefeller Center, the summer mm -hmm. garden, rewilding all that area. So, adding, you know, the Rockefeller Center is really interesting. It was the first site of the first. Um, botanic gardens in the whole of the United States. It was really? called the Elgin Gardens and then it transitioned into Rockefeller Center. And so there was 2,000 species that were housed there in, in the 1800s and where now they have a very limited palette of plants which they usually use. Um, so we're kind of expanding that limit of, that palette of plants and it's based upon the American meadow. So we're bringing all the indigenous species of the Northeast region back into Rockefeller Center. So that's been an incredible project. Um, there's a couple of rewilding projects over in England and upstate New York. And then there's a couple of projects on the horizon, which are much bigger with uh, a future studio, which is that collaborative. There's architects, material technologists, and myself, um, looking at really large scale developments in developing countries and how they can transition into more sustainable thinking. So as much as we can, as much as I can and my team can, we're just trying to um, try and try and move this transition phase forward and get this thinking on the ground. And low tech has just been an incredible catalyst mm -hmm. um, for all the ideas that I've had for many years and, and bringing it all to fruition and spreading the word. Wow, I'm so excited. I hope you're documenting all of this. I would 1000% <laughs> watch so many documentaries about everything that you're finding and, you know, how those types of things would be pushing for. I could so see this like blowing up on Netflix. I hope that's all in the works for you for sure. I mean, you are such a dream to interview and your breadth of knowledge and passion for change is so inspirational. The entire team at Fashion Snoops has been so inspired by you and your book and I really really want to thank you on the behalf of all of us it's really been my pleasure thank you so much please check out more about Julia and her work on her website in the Firestream um, text below and until then we'll speak next time thank Thanks you so much this was great bye